love to welcome Mauricio Romano, who is a Mexican-born creative currently working as an industrial designer on the Facebook AR and VR industrial design team. Here he played a role in the development of the Oculus Go and the Oculus Quest 2 headsets. Prior to Oculus, Mauricio worked as a consultant in San Francisco Astro Studios. So guys, everyone that has been using the Quest 2, we have one of the designers here, so it should be really interesting. Uh, welcome, Mauricio. Hello. Hello, everybody. Wow, all right. Do so we just I'll leave, I'll leave the stage to you, Mauricio. Over. All right, let's do it. Let's do okay. it. All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Yes, my name is Mauricio Romano. Uh, I'm an industrial designer at Facebook. You guys have already heard all of that, but probably the better introduction is for us to start at the very, very beginning. And that's 13 pound me in 1992 in Mexico City. Um, I moved around a lot when I was a lot younger. Uh, and it plays a part in, in what I'm going to talk about today. So just bear with me for a second. I went from Mexico City to Tucson, Arizona when I was three, to Iowa City when I was six, Redmond, Washington when I was nine, finally to college in Bellingham. I went to Western Washington University, and it's a pretty small school, and it has an industrial design program that only graduates 12 people. While there, between my junior and senior year, I had a year, about 15 months actually, where I worked at Intel. And this was my first kind of taste into consumer electronics, into the technical requirements that it took for consumer electronics. And that kind of set the groundwork for what would end up being the rest of my career. I went back to school. I ended up going to Astro Studios, where I worked on some virtual reality stuff, mostly just capture cameras, so the Aura. Uh, and then ultimately, I found myself, myself in Oculus, where I got to play a part in the Oculus Go and the Quest 2, and some of the upcoming work as well. Now, I'm obligated to say that I, um, I'm only sharing work and opinions that are my own. I am not speaking on behalf of anybody or anything or any employer. Uh, and I'm going to be talking a little bit more about some philosophical design work than I am uh, specific Oculus work. So just sit, send that out there. And the talk is called Tools. And it is kind of our mental framing and perception of product design and the products around us and how they work as tools for our brains without us knowing about it. And uh, yeah, so any presentation is not a good presentation unless you start with the Merriam-Webster definition of what the title of your presentation is. Uh, but that's a little corny. So I just went with the top two results on Google. Basically, a tool, by these definitions, is a, is a very physical object. It is a, a device or implement, one held in the hand, used to carry a particular function. Uh, and it, is, it gives you the ability to modify the surrounding environment. That's kind of how we, we're generally classifying these tools. But I'd like to present maybe another thought. And you know, at the end of this talk, I really would like to hear people's opinions on kind of what this framing might be like. And it starts with part one. And part one is that language is probably one of our most powerful tools as a product. Let's tell a story. At some point, I either read or heard a podcast about a group of researchers in the early 90s that plugged up a person's brain with a bunch of sensors and this person was special because this person spoke 14 languages, or so it said. What they noticed is that with any question that they would ask this person, their brain activity would be a lot wilder than people who only generally spoke one language or even just less languages. Now, I'm not entirely sure where the source of this story was from or if it's even true, but if you look online, 
there is an enormous mountain of academic, scholarly, uh, clinical work that is literally link, linking the number of languages that you know with the amount of gray matter in your head. And gray matter is, uh, is, is the pseudo matter that lives in your brain between the neurons. And it's a good way to connect neurons that wouldn't generally connect. This is also something that a lot of people in the behavioral psychology field consider a literal example of creativity. 45,000 results just on that alone. Like this, this stuff has been studied pretty good. And my biggest takeaway to all of this was mainly that now I understand why Spanglish is a thing. Because what's going on in your brain when you speak Spanglish is, is, is something that has an incredible amount of processing behind it that you don't actually consciously notice. You see, your brain is, is feeling emotions and thoughts and is forming things inside of your head. But the objective is to get that communication out. And what it does is it creates these tools. And a lot of times these tools are the language, are the vernacular that you have. And you use those words, the brain does, to communicate what's going on inside. And you're trying to do this to communicate with another human. This is what Spanglish or any other mix of these languages tend to be thought to be. Uh, it is your brain connecting words in the most efficient way that it finds it knows how to connect. This carries a pattern of the path of least resistance that you find in a lot of behavior behind the human psyche. And that is to say that we as creatures are inherently lazy or have evolved to be inherently lazy. And this was our competitive advantage. Now we will touch on this in a bit. Mainly, and I just copy pasted this from the internet here, but some researcher has concluded that the spoken communication of humans from one human to another is about 20 bits per second. And that is using your words and having a casual conversation with someone else. Across most languages, this level of communication, this amount of data that is being transferred is generally pretty similar. Uh, you might have romance languages where the words don't mean as much in that you have a lot of words and you have to put a lot of words together. And that's, that's probably why a lot of people consider romance languages to be so fast. You have other languages like Chinese where syllables and the sounds of the syllables communicate more information. And so the, 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 the way that it's spoken is a little bit slower, but the information in that language is a little bit faster. All told across most manners of speaking, the information transfer is about the same. It's about 20 bits a second. If we compare this with the USB 3 speed, that's five gigabits a second. And this, that meant nothing to me until you see it like this. That is 20 bits a second to a comparative 5 billion bits a second, which is what a computer can communicate and transfer through. So we think about the path of least resistance and we think about trying to communicate point A to point B. Language is a tool to get us there, but there are better tools. And this isn't an observation that I've had. In fact, this is an observation that I've stolen. And uh, many smarter people than I have, have come to this conclusion, but I'll point out one of them. And that's Don Norman. He's the author of uh, The Design of Everyday Things. I'm sure a lot of people have read that book. I've read it multiple times. It's like a holy Bible to me. Now, in this book, Don coins a term called the gulfs of execution. And what it essentially is, it, it is quantifying or giving shape in an allegorical way to how our brains think about the different steps that they require to get something done. 
A gulf of execution is the gap between a user's goal and the means to execute that goal. So let's 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 draw it out here real quick. It is explained as a tightrope, and you are on the far left side here, and you want to go to the far right side. Now, in a dream world, you just go there. There's no steps. What you want, you just get there. Obviously, this isn't always the case. And there's always certain barriers that you have to hit to, to get to that final goal. The more barriers that you have, the more that this tightrope sinks and the less likely you are to actually complete this task. So let's talk about it as a story. And I, I'm sure this is quite relatable to some. Don was sitting on a chair at some point and he noticed that the screw at the bottom of his chair fell out. Now, you know the right solution is to go, in his case upstairs, find your screwdriver, come back downstairs and then fix that chair right up. All is good. Now, did he do this? Absolutely not. You just use your hand. And the reality here, you might not realize it, you might not have consciously thought about it, is that you are seeing a whole bunch of barriers to your final solution that, quite frankly, you could probably avoid. And the quality of the second solution that's a lot more convenient, it's not going to be as tight of a screw, but it's going to be a lot more convenient. And there is also clinical science that suggests that people will pick convenience over quality pretty much every time. And Amazon agrees. In fact, in the late 90s, Amazon was uh, the head of a, of, a, of a clinical study where they realized that every single page between the shopping cart and the final purchase click was losing 10% of their customers. So some, some know it as, a, as the, the checkout cart graveyard, you know? The more barriers that you are put, that are put in front of you, even if they're very light, even if they're just one website or one web click away, like it is still perceived as a barrier in your brain. This study is what Amazon uh, used to come up with the one click buy to help get rid of all the excess steps that are in there. So basically, to summarize on the part one here, is a tool is a device or a mechanism to help us reduce the friction of our daily lives. And I think the, the main point and the main allegory that I'm trying to give away on this, on this part is the fact that these tools, they are, they are mainly definitions on going from point A to point B. You are a person with an objective and you need to use the tools around you to achieve that objective. That box is product design. And there are some very good examples of the success of this thinking. And uh, I think Steve Jobs was exceptionally talented at seeing the world through this sort of friction lens of the gulfs of execution. I know Don worked a little bit on the early Apple stuff. Maybe there was some influence. I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe it was just intuitive like that. Before Apple changed the way that computers are sold and used, I don't know how many of you guys might remember this, but to install a new computer was really difficult and really annoying. Most of the time, it wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't come charged. You'd have to install the mat, uh, you'd have to install the OS, you'd have to install your apps, and you'd have to figure out how all of those steps worked. So perceptually, if you were a person in the early 2000s, late 90s, and you wanted a computer, your goal of using the computer for whatever you needed to use that computer was filled with a bunch of extra steps on that gulf of execution. Now it seems pretty obvious now. But it was a very revolutionary thought at the time where your device came charged. The, the OS was already installed. The apps that you needed, ready to go. And so the friction that a lot of people generally tended to feel 
uh, along with tech, like alongside of technology, suddenly it became a lot more palatable. And that convenience over quality changed the game. He did it with music as well. At some point, you had cassette tapes. There was no starting and stopping. There was no finding the song. You just kind of had to scroll forward and figure it out. And that meant that to find the song that you wanted, you had to deal with a fair amount of goals of execution. CDs improved upon it, much like a lot of technologies would improve upon these things. They, they get rid of some of those levels of friction. In Steve's case, he just took it all the way. And we got the iPod. This kind of thinking, I think, is a, is a really good thought exercise in the way that you shape the products that you make and that you design. Um, I think a lot of times we are driven to design products based on the last version of a product that, it, that existed. And, uh, and I challenge some of you guys to, to maybe look at those products more as a, as a graph of friction and more as a graph of what that thing is supposed to be like, and then maybe work at it from that perspective. Now, this one here, this is just a little side concept that I had been working on, on and off for a little bit. But the idea here is it's a music player. And the thought is that the way that you interact with your music can be sped up a lot. Um, at some point, at least nowadays, when I want to find a song that I want to listen to or a playlist that I want, I have to open my phone, open the app, find the playlist tab, find my playlist, hit the song. And suddenly, even though we've transferred into a world of software where things are easier to do, the steps that it takes to get to that final point is still not all that intuitive yet. And you'll notice this with a lot of the older generation not to point any fingers, but they struggle with a lot of these extra steps. And they might seem intuitive to us, but again, kind of as we talked about before, there is this inherent drive to be lazy. It is the inherent evolutionary drive that we have. It is our advantage, actually. And that drives how we pick the products that we choose. So in this concept, the idea was that you're, you're, blur you're, you're blurring the lines between the software and the hardware, and you have these little details that you interact with without having to scroll through different menus. And I, I think the quote that I like about this is, 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 is kind of a, a UX optimization game. And it is, you know, you can have a product that has nine buttons and you only have to press any one of those buttons one time, or you might have a product that only has one button, but you might have to press that button nine times. There is no proper solution to this. It, it really is on a case-by-case -case basis. But I think the thought experiment there is, is kind of interesting and in to say that, you know, maybe it's better to have three buttons and you only have to press each of them three times. It's a balance. The main point is that we use the tools to remove the friction in our lives. Part two. I struggled a lot to explain this part because there's a lot of examples that we can use to talk about it. I think the one that made the most sense and is a little bit the most literal to the point I'm trying to make is architecture. There is evidence of concrete as early as 1400 years ago. There is definite evidence that says that the Romans figured out how to get concrete to a stable uh, product tool by the 400s. And this revolutionized architecture forever. Um, they were able to build tools and buildings like they had never built before. And these are buildings that still exist today. And in fact, it's still architecture that we reference in the modern era. Now, obviously the concrete used by the Romans and the concrete used in today's days is, is, is very different. But the pattern is very much the same. In the 400s, a new concrete was developed 
that was able to get mass produced and, and, and made quickly and effectively and efficiently. And they were able to make the buildings that reflected that technology. In that instance, we'd consider concrete as a tool. Similar pattern in architecture, a couple hundred years later. During, and, uh, during the late 19th century, steel was finally able to be produced at a mass manufacturing high quality yield. And this opened the world up for skyscrapers. Suddenly the world of architecture had a new vector, a new tool, a new giant building that they could put in a space to be more efficient in, in, so far as space went. However, there was, a, there was a, a little window in this time where elevators weren't invented yet. And there's a, there's a really fascinating social phenomenon that happened where before the elevators really took off on these skyscrapers, what we know as the penthouse today was actually where the poorest people used to live in these taller buildings. And that was because the rich people didn't want to walk up all the buildings and all the stairs to get there, right? The second that elevators were adopted into these tall buildings, it completely flipped. And it was, it, it's an example of how the tool, which is the elevator, totally affected the society and flipped literally the way that skyscrapers were organized upside down. And that's what led to the skyscrapers that we know and love today. Let's keep going. At some point, CAD was introduced into the architectural community. And what I always found fascinating about this was if you look at the architecture from the period before CAD, and you look at the architecture of the period after CAD, you will notice that a lot of the work that was done beforehand was very linear. It was almost like it's the kind of work that is more conducive to the kind of tool that the architects had at the time. And that's kind of the, 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 the big key point that I'm trying to make with all of this is it is the tool that defines the product. And it is the tool, in this instance, the architecture, it is, it is CAD that gave humans the ability to create these crazy flowing parametric objects, right? Much like with language, it is the tool of language that we have in our brains to communicate the thoughts that we have in those brains. You could technically use language to communicate this building, but you'd have to do it at a rate of 20 bits per second. So it's not as efficient. So all of the work that we do with our tools and to communicate the work of those tools, it all compounds. And that's the second allegory to this whole presentation. That compounding is like a frontier. And the way that I'm going to explain this requires me to talk about Age of Empires 2. I know not everyone's played this game, but when you start, it's a game about building civilizations, right? And you start with one building and a couple villagers in a, in a world of blackness. And, and your map is black. And you have to explore this map. And as you explore it, you see more. And, 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 and this is kind of the pattern that I see with a lot of design and, and, and cutting edge design. It is, okay, so let's say we're, we're Romans or Greeks pre-concrete. Well, these are the buildings that are familiar to us. Suddenly, concrete is introduced as a tool that we can use. And we venture out into this new frontier that is building buildings with concrete. We get pretty good at it. And eventually that just becomes a part of who we are as a society is we have concrete buildings now. That's just what it's like. And this sort of innovation can happen in every single direction. It can happen in medicine, in, uh, in architecture, in, in design, in science. It's, it's we reach a frontier of what we knew was possible. And now that we're there, we can see a little bit further. This is also a pattern. And as this pattern grows, the cumulative knowledge 
of humanity also grows with it. And suddenly, we're able to make skyscrapers all over the world, and not just in Rome. Now, if we combine this with some of the thinking that, uh, that we had in part one, where we're talking about tools, then the tool is the goal of reducing friction between your beginning and your end. Frontiers are the exploration of exploring the very edge. Now, the ultimate goal for a designer, I believe, is to lower the number of friction points in our products. So in this graphic here, we might have our frontier and a couple extra steps will take us to the next frontier. Ideally, with good design, we can make that first frontier feel a lot closer because there's less steps between starting, starting point A and ending point B. And suddenly, the frontier that felt so far away is much more accessible to all the people inside of that society. And there is a new frontier off in the distance with a whole bunch of different levels of friction. And that's the second allegory, is the advancement of our society is built upon the cumulative knowledge of our tools and our society and how hard it is to get those tools to do the work that we want them to do. So a tool is a mechanism that allows our brains to accomplish their desire, whether it's communication or whether it's something maybe as literal as driving a nail. You can't really, maybe not with a lot of pain, but you can't really drive a nail with your hand, right? So you need a hammer. That's the, that's the tool for the job. Much like I can't give this presentation without a, a couple slides. This slide document, that's my tool for the job. So let's put it together a little bit. And to put it together, I want to talk about one last phenomenon, behavioral psychology phenomenon, and that is the Tetris effect. And, uh, and the idea here is that when your mind is so overloaded or so accustomed to a certain activity, it will start to shape its way of thinking based on that activity. And this has been studied and, and, and clinically researched, and it's based off of the game Tetris because a lot of people that have found an obsession to Tetris tend to see an ability or tend to have an ability to see shapes in the world and piece them together or to dream about Tetris. Now, the way that I see this is, is similar to kind of that path of least resistance graphic where it's your brain is just finding the, the, the easiest way to communicate its thought and, and express it outside. And, and so the activities and the things that you do, your experiences define the shape of your brain's framing. That framing is based on the tools and the experiences that you have had, but ultimately they become the building blocks for the way that you think. One example of this would be, um, let's just assume that the whole world worked on metric, right? What a dream, but the whole world worked on metric. Well, all of humanity's tools would be based on a building block based on the metric system. So all of our things would be one millimeter, two millimeter, would be a fraction divisible by millimeters. That is our tool to build it. And, 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 and it doesn't matter what we do, it's, it's, it's very core particle is that. So to connect it to kind of gravity sketch and CAD and where we're at today in today's society, I wanted to dig at some of the work I did in school because I think CAD software is one of those frontiers that we are approaching and is about to change very drastically. When I was in school, no one really taught me how to do surfacing or how to do CAD. It was all very basic fundamental stuff. And I, I worked in Booleans. It was make a shape, make a circle, make a sphere, subtract, cut, slice. It was, there was no surfacing here. It was all cuts, right? And the thing was, it didn't matter what was in my head because my, 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 my talking perception, my bottleneck was the program that I was using. So as long as I didn't know how to surface or do very high detailed surfacing, all of my work and all of my products were going to have the same language 
as the tool that I was using, which was booleans, cuts, slices, subtracts. And that's kind of where I see the fascination with gravity sketch or, or, or what gets me excited about it. And, and, and just kind of what we're doing in the whole VR space, right? It's suddenly I am, I am seeing a bunch of students and professionals and uh, all over the world who are achieving levels of surfacing in a way that is much easier for most people. And it kind of combines into this, the, the, the patterns that we've been talking about in the sense that, well, you know, at some point surfacing was really difficult. And if we go back to that image of like one of the first CAD programs, it probably was pretty hard to build some cool things when your computer couldn't handle all the crazy lines. But nowadays the technology and the tools are becoming so accessible that you're seeing people build these crazy complicated surfaced objects in Gravity Sketch with a lot of ease. And I think this is a, a fantastic nod to the goals of execution. I think being able to have people get the ideas that are in their brain out faster and easier is a huge deal. And it is, it is a bigger deal than just the programs and the titles. It is, it is a huge deal on a, on, a, on a human scale. Ultimately, this, this philosophy of mine is, is based on just this. I, I, I legitimately feel that industrial design is improving today's tools and figuring out tomorrow's. And, and I think industrial design narrows that down for myself, but I just generally think design is figuring out where we're at in this giant timeline, figuring out our tools of the giant timeline and making them all better. You know, there'll be tools in the future for, you know, VR headsets are showing up. And now we need to figure out VR programs. And those are the tools. Gravity Sketch is one of those tools. That's it. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> awesome. Really great, really great talk, Mauricio. I could have Thank just you. kind of like continued listening to like your theory if it, if it had more chapters. I, it, it'll always get built on. <laughs> There's a lot of there's a lot of thank yous, a lot of greats, a lot of claps, a lot of really good stuff here. Like everyone seems to be really loving your presentation. And so I'm trying to like find the questions. One thing that we, I think we should do first is just open up the mic for whoever wants to like ask the question themselves and then we can read the ones in the chat. Um, so, Jaren, can you help us um, turn Noah's mic on, please? Mauricio. ¿Cómo estás? Can muy bien. Me? Sí, sí, muy bien. Hola. Spanglish, Danglish. <laughs> so, We've all been there. San Francisco in the house. So, you just broke my brain, but I have a question. Totally. Well, I, I mean, I started in San Francisco and then I wandered off into the dark hallways of sports product design, like cheaper socks that look better. Um, so this is going way back, but there's this thing happening in my head that you just shook loose when I use Gravity Sketch. And that is this transition that we're coming up on to augmented life. I mean, you wear glasses, I have glasses. So of course I want Google Earth in my eyes at all times or sea life or autumn mm -hmm. colors or whatever. Well, who's gonna create those experiences? Obviously we are designers, which is the irony too, right? Industrial design, well, am I a product designer or am I an industrial designer, right? Like that's this new thing. And the answer is yes. Um, but I am, I am trained as, a, as, a, as an industrial designer. So as I'm looking at the world through my Ray-Ban Google Glass, whatever we're going to call them. And I'm, ex I'm consuming these experiences, these objects, these, these beautiful things. What are the tools? What is the hardware? I need hardware. Come on. Totally. Like what, what is the hardware in, in your mind? I mean, I, I love software, but that's for people that are way smarter than me or have more patience than me with math. I love actually designing the tools. I have an aunt who was the leading expert on hand tools in the world. She worked with Lewis Leakey. 
like in the old of I gorge, right? Like digging up these hand tools. I'm curious, I want to nail you down to some industrial design here. What do you see some really beautiful tools being in this next generation for us? To well, create obviously everything that Facebook's going to make. Um, <laughs> <laughs> of course. But more, more realistically, I've actually had this conversation with a lot of, it's been a heated discussion in, in, in my friend groups um, over what is industrial design getting into, right? Um, I think one, which is kind of like the immediate example is industrial design is kind of going to exist inside of software again. And it, it's almost going to be like you're designing hardware inside of the software. Uh, and I, I'm not sure what that is going to look like, but I can't imagine it'd be much different from traditional industrial design in the physical world. My personal opinion on it is that we are always physical creatures and we will always be physical creatures, at least as far as I can perceptually feel right now. And that means that we will always need a certain portal into this software world that we are creating, right? Um, there's, there's a quote by Elon Musk at some point that's basically just saying that we are cyborgs, right? That we are really not all that different from cyborgs. Like this thing that we have, this phone, it's always on our body, on our brain is always connected to that phone, which in turn is connected to the internet as well. As a result, even if that phone isn't physically attached to our bodies, it is a perpetual link into this internet of cumulative human knowledge. And as a result, humans are kind of acting more as a giant blob of a species than ever before. I think in our immediate future, as far as industrial design is concerned, we will need those tools and we will find ways to simplify those frictions that we talked about. So for example, and, and this is like looking at kind of what glasses are and, and phones are, it's like, do you really think we're gonna be carrying around a little block of something in 50 years? I don't know, maybe not. Maybe it'll all be glasses, I don't know. All right. Um... Anyone else wants to speak? All right, no one else. Everyone is hiding behind the chat. <laughs> Great. Um, unfortunately, novice users of tools easily get limited by their tools. It's sometimes difficult to determine at which point the tool becomes an enabler or when it becomes an obstacle towards the end goal. The only solution is to keep practicing. What would you say to that? I agree 1,000%, 1,000%. Um, I think the, the most frustrating part to trying to learn a new program when you already know one is that your brain knows from point A to point B on the other program, and there's more levels of friction on the new program for that, right? And so it's no matter what you're doing, like, let's just say you're trying to loft a tube to be a roll cage on something. If you know how to do it in two steps in SOLIDWORKS, and then you go to Rhino and it takes 10 steps, all of those steps in Rhino are going to be fighting your intuition all the time, right? Um, yeah, I totally lost the, the first question, but I think that I think there was an answer in that. Yeah, there was. <laughs> um, all right, we have two more people raising their hands. So just T3. Go for it. Uh, sorry. Hello. <laughs> Hello, just T3. <laughs> just T3. All is T3. But I put just T3. So I don't know. Confusing. <laughs> uh, well, uh, my question is um, it kind of stays off the presentation. And just because I'm asking, I was asking about the Oculus too. Um, so, like, what? What was, well, not what, well, not what was wrong. It's like, what were the improvements from the first Oculus to the second Oculus and why, why were they made? That's what I want to ask. Because if Next you said- Next question. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Is it like a too much? <laughs> I, it's, it's just, it's, it's, it, I'm not entirely sure what's, what's, what's good to talk about or not in specific VR terms. So I, I'd rather not. Okay. <laughs> All right, cool. 
right, Tad. Thanks for the question, though. Thanks for the question, though. Yes, it's, it's cool. I just uh, got rejected. It's fine. <laughs> Dad, you can speak. Hola, hola. Hola. ¿Me escuchas? Uh -huh. Hola, Mauricio. Eh, hola. Te habla un hermano mexicano, eh, universitario. And I just want to ask, how much impact do you think could be achieved if virtual reality design is implemented for university studies. You cut out a little bit for me. I didn't hear the full question, sorry. Yeah, I will repeat. Uh, how much impact do you think it could be achieved if virtual reality design is implemented for university studies? Huge, 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 huge. Um, most, in my own research and my own experience, most sociological changes happen generationally. They don't happen mid-generations, right? Um, they tend to be in these periods of 30 years. And a lot of times it's, it, it's kind of like your, your current thinking that you build when you're younger in your younger years is the thinking that you carry all the way through your whole life. So I think the, the target with a lot of the VR stuff is is that younger generation is is figuring out how to get those tools to that younger generation and when you combine that with a tool that is a lot easier to use and gets you a lot further in that kind of allegorical frontier uh fog of war kind of a map um i do legitimately think that between that between the frontier part and then the other one is also like the bit the 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 speed of communication transfer is going to change as well. So let me start this over because I just kind of worked through the question a bit. I think virtual reality development as a piece of hardware and software together for CAD in schools is going to be enormous. And I do legitimately think it is the next step in general CAD software as, as an aside. And I think this is coming from multiple angles. Uh, the one angle, which is kind of the phase part one of my presentation, was the level and speed of communication and information transfer, right? So when you are able to CAD something that's very complicated, very fast, and you're able to share that in presence with somebody, uh, it's, it's kind of the, the quintessential pictures worth a thousand words deal, but you're now coming at it with part two of the presentation, which is not only are you simplifying the levels of friction for that upcoming generation, two, you are speeding up the speed of communication of those tools. So not only are you able to get further, you're able to show more. That is unavoidable. And that's going to happen in the world of, of virtual reality, physical reality, whatever. It's just, if there's a better way to communicate more information, you're going to use it. And virtual reality is, is showing a way to communicate more information than ever before. And so when you draw the line of ways that humans have figured out to communicate, you know, we go from spoken language with, you know, a small vernacular, spoken language with more vernacular, drawings, images, videos. It's like there is a linear curve that shows the amount of information you can communicate is, is, is what will succeed. I mean, v, VHS to DVDs, you can put more information on a DVD, right? Um, so we're kind of on the cusp of this world where we can communicate a lot more with a lot easier tools. And I think that's just going to change everything. Thanks. Um, all right. We have many more. So Wolfgang. You can unmute yourself now, Wolfgang. Hello, can you can you hear me? I can hear you. Hey, uh, my name is my name is Christian. I, I just go by C Wolfgang. Uh, I I love doing hard surface like you were just mentioning. Um, I got into this because I I loved ZBrush and then it evolved into Medium, Oculus Medium, 
and uh and it also kind of teetered with gravity sketch very much so rivaled that and the next thing i saw was nomad and people were using their tablets to use this thing called nomad and it's been blowing up right now and i'm just like dang people are just making things at such a such an insane rate right now and i'm like how do i cool you know teeter that and i'm trying to do that constantly with my friend cable we're trying to do all this stuff so fast and i feel like our heads are just exploding sometimes because we're doing this at such a fast rate and i'm thinking what's going to happen next is like are they going to start like you know with the, with with your your goggle content you just you someone just said the contact lenses what if they start doing that with the eyes the cortex the spine Okay. Um, and what if they start doing this with like dendrites and like they start having these like <laughs> synthetic dendrites that are even faster that pick up things um, and relate things. You know, I just, I don't know, I was just thinking way too much last night about the limbic system and I was explaining that to my girlfriend and we were just looking at all these different Just weird another things. Wednesday, yeah? <laughs> just, just another Wednesday. Yeah, we, we, we just, we were just having fun and just talking about, um, we actually were listening to a certain band and they had this uh, this experiment where they do these uh, tests on soldiers and the British used tests on soldiers uh, back in the day and they used uh, different chemicals to, you know, see what they would, how they would perform and if they would perform these things. And eventually the rocket team were dismantling their rockets and they were laughing about what they were doing because it was just like bizarre. And they were just feeding the, they're trying to feed the birds and doing all this hippie stuff, basically. And I'm thinking, what is the next thing for this, like, uh, like frontier? It's like the metaverse thing is going on right now. We have NFTs. That's an, another bull crap that I hate talking about because I feel like I get bombarded by all these fake chatbots every day, right? So we got like all that, like in our face. And it's like kind of like, overwhelming like we're being targeted or selected like you kind of were talking about almost uh in this talk and i thought that was really interesting uh every little aspect of this talk was i don't know really uh, enlightening and I, what i wanted to really touch on my question is when, when do you think the the studio share is going to be like a big thing i think you may have touched on it in the previous question as well when is studio share going to be a, like uh replacing phones I feel like I feel like that's going to be a real thing with studio share replacing devices and already previous devices, like you said, like the phone, it's going to disappear and evaporate. Is that going to go into our next like ghost in the shell? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I mean, the, how, I, fast, I just realized... how fast do you think this is around the corner? Like, how fast do you think the body implements, uh, the augments are with the contact lenses, the eyeballs? How how far do you think that is? Because we have the arms, the hands. Yep. I have I have no idea. I have no idea. Um, I, I think a lot of a lot of that stuff is is like you, it's it's difficult. It's much more difficult once you jump jump into it. Um, than than initially realized and, and and so then that development it's it's kind of like a like an s curve right it's like you, you you cover a lot of ground at first and then near the end your returns are a lot slower and slower and it takes more effort and more effort i'm not entirely sure what the answer to that is i i think you know in one of the other answered questions i was talking about like the heated you know debates that i have with some of my other design friends and it's about like the hardware and how there's all there will always be hardware well the other side of that debate is is just that idea is well maybe it'll be contact lenses maybe it'll be implanted into our brains like maybe that maybe that's what's next and you know very well it very well might be um and i don't know the answer to that but what i what i do think i can't answer is if in statistics sometimes it's helpful to get two points on your graph and then you can draw a line between them and just kind of see where it might be going now, this isn't, you're not going to base your whole portfolio on this strategy, but it's a good way to kind of, you know, get a, get a gesture of the vector of energy. It's going kind of in that direction, right? Um, I think those two points and, and, and the reason that I, I framed this talk in the way that I talked, it, 
is is in that kind of like chapter one and chapter two, right? I think the first point is understanding that we as humans want to remove friction from our lives. So anything that creates friction, we will try to find a way to remove. So look at the things around you, like your phone, and try to remove levels of friction to it. Like maybe it's carrying this thing, right? It's kind of annoying to carry, especially when maybe you're already wearing glasses or doing something of that nature. Okay, so maybe that's a point of friction. So then we can start thinking about, okay, well, now we're going to, you know, maybe implant a phone into our brain. But then maybe there's some other levels of friction there that you have to go into surgery. And then that doesn't feel as intuitive or convenient as just having a little square that's in your pocket. So I, I don't know what the answer is going to be like. I just know that those are kind of influences that are going to massage that into a solution that is going to be the least friction with the most return. Um, is that cerebral cortex stuff? I don't know. Maybe it is. Maybe it is. Maybe it's not. I don't know. We do have another hand from uh, uh, Justin, I believe is how you say it. Um, uh, if you want to go ahead, uh, Justin. Hi. <clears throat> Thanks for your presentation. Uh, so my question for you is, what are the immediate, middle-term, and long-term points of friction that you see between where we are now and ubiquitous augmented reality? Next question. <laughs> Sorry. All right, so no answer for that one. <laughs> um, yeah, well, it's great. You're getting kind of like really deep and really kind of like extreme questions. You must have uh, I, shown something important. Guys, at, reach out to me at any point. If anyone in here, all 148 participants have ideas on this. Just let's let's just chat about it. I'm serious. Let's just chat about it. I'm down to chat about it. This is I, I, I this is something that's very it's a big passion of mine is kind of like where technology is going and how we play a part in that. And uh, for me, it's fascinating to see it in a scheme of thousands of years. Like we're we're not all that different from developing a new kind of concrete that helps us build giant domey buildings, right? It's like we're developing a new kind of headset that's helping us build giant domey virtual reality buildings, right? It's like th those patterns are patterns that exist no matter what. And, and, and it's just the, 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 the specific tool of that pattern is going to be different per generation, right? Um, I think where we're at in our generation on that giant scheme of, of product evolution of tools is, is a really interesting kind of turning point. It's like we're, we're, we're entering kind of like this this magnitude of information transfer time. And uh, <laughs> I think it's interesting. Cool. All right. So we have two more. Well, we have a lot of questions, but I'll read two more and uh, then we'll be done. Um, so there's one from Diego SQL. In terms of sketching slash sculpting in VR, I feel there's a line that's getting thinner between industrial design and creative 3D design. Optimizing 3D content for any medium is now is key now. What do you think? I think those are those are tools to a means. Um, I think industrial design is is uh, offensively narrow. I I also think product design is offensively narrow. I, I I think these are just kind of disciplines that you use to play a part in that big flow of product development that has been going on since since concrete days. Um, sketching versus CAD versus displaying that CAD as a sketch is is just all different ways to communicate bits of data to another human being. And uh, and whatever's more convenient for you, like I, I know some designers that can sketch in 3D really accurately, very fast, and that's a good way to communicate. And then other people use CAD to communicate, gravity sketch to communicate. Um, I think there, there's no specific flow 
uh, I think at the end of the day, it's you are a, a human being with a brain that's kind of lazy and you want to communicate it to another human being with a brain that's kind of lazy. And um, you're going to try to find the, the easiest way to do that. Cool. All right. We'll end with this one, which is, I mean, it could, it could be me asking you this one, but it's someone else. So David Neal says, based on your presentation and your experience with Gravity Sketch, what do you feel is the strongest and most relevant tool that should be the ad you should that should be added to Gravity Sketch based on the heuristic heuristics of the tool inherently? <laughs> um, tight DFM manufacturable control of, of your points and surfaces. There you go, David, and there you go. <laughs> All right, well, we are reaching the end of this session. It has been great having you, Mauricio. Thank you so much for blowing our minds today. <laughs> Thank you, Daniela. Thanks for the invite. This is, uh, it was exciting to get a chance to share this thought. I hope it was, uh, it was entertaining for most. I'm sure like, it definitely was. We had so, much, so many com comments, so many. Nice. All good ones. All good ones. Um, nice. All right. Well, thank you so much, Mauricio. And for the next talk, we'll come back in 15 minutes. So stay tuned. See you later. See you. Thanks, guys.